How about 1 Peter chapter number 5? 1 Peter chapter number 5. And uh, I'm going to pick up where we were uh, this morning. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 when we're here in Sunday school. Now this morning in Sunday school, if you were here for that, uh, we talked about the uh, presenting yourself and the purging yourself. Uh, and now there's a permitting of yourself. There's a, there's a submission, a subjection, a surrender is a good word. Uh, can God do with you what he wants to do with you? That's a tough thing. Uh, I like the passage in the Bible. As a matter of fact, in my Bible reading, I'm along in that particular portion where uh, Jeremiah is there on the uh, wheel there, or the clay is on the wheel. And the potter is talking to the clay, and the clay is talking to the potter, and so on and so forth. There's an exchange going on there. But here's what I see in that. How often has it been in my life that I don't like how the potter is making the clay? And how often in my life I have had uh, uh, things that have occurred in my life where I feel like, without a question, that the potter's kind of put pressure in certain places and warped me, not realizing he was trying to make me. And uh, sometimes those things are uncomfortable. Now, maybe you haven't ever had that experience with the Lord. Maybe everything He's done with you has always been sweet and kind and gentle, and you've always fully understood it. Uh, for me, there's a lot of times I don't understand it. And I know theologically that that's walking by faith. But i got to be honest with you, walking sometimes by sight gets in the way. Because oftentimes the Lord will do certain things, and I'm thinking, what do you got to do that for? Because he sees things that we can't see. So in 1 Peter chapter number 5, we're just going to use this to start with. And then I'm going to give you a few verses here for you to take the time to, uh, to look up, to get an idea. Uh, this thought maybe would come to your mind. Uh, tribulation is really a blessing. It's the fashioning process that the Lord chooses to use to make us into what he would have us to be, not what we want to be. And subjection of ourselves to that. Uh, and how willing we are to, be, uh, to allow him to do that shows whether or not we love him. Look, if you will, please. 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, Be sober, verse number 8, you know the passage, and be vigilant, the adversary, the devil, roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Isn't that a blessing to know that what you're going through, somebody else is going through it too? But I hate to tell you this, it doesn't give you much comfort. You ever have somebody say this to you, you know, well, you know, I had a problem with my foot, but I saw somebody with no legs, and okay, that's fine. But if your foot pain is really bad, knowing that somebody else doesn't have leg doesn't help your foot pain. That's the truth of the matter. I, I mean, that kind of sounds nice to say, but the truth of the matter is, just knowing somebody else is going through something worse doesn't help you when you're in it. And then notice, if, if you will, please, knowing this, verse number 10, but, I like that, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have, <laughs> and don't you hate the afters? The buts and the afters. But, after that you have suffered, how long is a while? For Paul, it was the rest of his ministry. Say, I'd like to get caught up to heaven like Paul. Really? Would you like to spend the last 30 years of your life having a thorn in the flesh? You sure you want to get caught to heaven? So, well, if I got caught up to heaven, I'd be able to endure that. And you can't talk about it? I mean, it'd be kind of a hard secret to sit on, wouldn't it? Notice what he says, after you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish and strengthen and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then he starts to talk about Sylvanus here. Brother uh, um, Ernie, you pray and ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated as you're being seated. Could you come with me to the book of Acts chapter number 14? Acts chapter number 14. I want you to consider a couple of things. Now... Uh, come to the book of Acts and then back up over one book to the book of John. Leave your finger there in Acts chapter number 14. I want you to come to John chapter number 16. I want to give you something doctrinal. And this is being misquoted right now in the day and time in which you live. Right now, individuals are trying to teach that you're going to go through the tribulation period. When I say the tribulation period, for those of you that don't know, I'm talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. 
When I'm talking about the tribulation period, I'm talking about the period of time where the Lord finishes up the 70 weeks that are determined upon thy people Israel to finish the transgression. When I talk about the tribulation period, I'm talking about the mark of the beast being here. I'm talking about Moses and Elijah coming to preach. I'm talking about 144,000 male virgin Jews that are going to be also allowed to preach. I'm talking about a time of signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm talking about a time that during, that, during which you have to have faith in Jesus Christ and keep the commandments. I'm talking about a time where everywhere you turn, those uh, things that take place, the trumpets, the bowls, the vials, all of those things come out during the tribulation period. When I say the tribulation period, I'm not talking about generalized suffering. I'm talking about a period of time that occurs after the rapture of the church. You're not appointed to that tribulation. Well, if you don't rightly divide your Bible, then you're going to take the word tribulation and you're going to do what a lot of people do with the word baptism and think that every time the word baptism is mentioned, we're talking about water. We're not talking about water. As a matter of fact, there's only a few of the incidences that are talking about water. Sometimes it's a baptism of the Spirit and a couple of places, a baptism of the Holy Ghost and another place, it has to do with a baptism of fire. Lord baptizes with fire. Baptize. You don't want the baptism. That's going to hell. You don't want to be baptized with that fire. And so, you know, what, what happens is, is if you don't understand what I'm about to show you here, then you get caught up in the modern day theology. And modern day theology says, well, uh, we have a problem with the person that's in the White House. We have a problem going on in Ukraine. I just read an article just uh, on the plane a couple of days ago. And this guy goes into this long dissertation to try to prove to you that the four horses of the apocalypse have started riding. And they started over there when Russia came in and invaded Ukraine. That has nothing any more to do with the tribulation period than a billy goat. And it has nothing to do with the four horses of the apocalypse starting to ride. If there are four, there may be five. But the bottom line is this. Those four horses show up at the tribulation. They're not riding right now. You may have famine. You may have earthquakes. You may have pestilence. You may have all kinds of problems and difficulties that are happening here. But you're not in the tribulation. You don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. Vaccinated, not vaccinated, driver's license, no driver's license, social security, no social security, getting a chip, go to cryptocurrency, all the things that they're talking about happen. It's a setup for the system of government that's coming, but you're not in that system yet. Now, the Lord is fixing to say something to you in the book of Matthew, that, or excuse me, the book of John, that you need to grab a hold of and you need to build a fence around it and understand that the Lord himself promised you something. And he told you, according to the Bible, that in this world you're going to have tribulation. But he does not say you are going to go through the tribulation. Now, if you're here tonight and you're lost, if the rapture happens in the next five seconds, if you're lost, you can have all of our car keys, you can have all of our houses, you can have all of our blood-soaked money, you can have everything we have. We're out of here. See you later. When you get through chewing on your tongue and banging your head on the wall, you can have all the possessions you want for as long as you want them because you're going to die one day in the tribulation and you're going to go to hell because you've heard the gospel. If anything, you've heard it here. And so as a result of that, you don't get a second chance. This idea of Southerners come around, you know, well, you know, if that rapture thing's real, you know, when that happens, I'll go ahead and trust the Lord then. No, you won't. No, you won't. The Bible says that God himself will send you strong delusion and you're going to believe a lie. God sends you the truth. Why? Because when you heard the truth, you received not the love of the truth. And God says then because of that, you're damned. Now, if you're saved, I realize that's harsh. You say, what is that? That's the Lord. He's kind of being straightforward. Yeah, he's black and white. He's up or down. There's no in the middle there. There's no, well, I'm kind of making an exception to the rule and we got a dimmer switch going and we're making a change. No, rapture happens. If you've heard the gospel, you're roasted. You're just as good in hell with the door shut. You got one foot on a banana peel and the other one's already in the grave. And when you do survive during the period of time and you play Rambo for a few weeks or a couple of months or whatever and you're able to dodge all the bullets and the, the things that come out of the center of the earth and all that stuff takes place, still you're going to die one day. And when you die, you know what's going to do? You're going to die worshiping Satan. And guess where you're going to go? You're going to go to his abode. He's not going to be there. He's going to be up here ruling the earth. Now, you need to quit worrying about all that foolishness going on and worrying about the economy going up, the economy going down, and we're going to go through a recession, and this is it, and God's done with the United States of America. Same thing they said during Y2K. 
Same thing they said when the towers came down. You don't know when the end of the United States is coming. But I can tell you this, if the Bible's right, as time grows closer, the church is going to wind up being more and more odd, strange, and unusual. You folks are strange to the people in the world. Because you're not caught up with the rest of the stuff going on in the world. Your life is not tied up in the economy or monkeypox or some vaccine or worrying about the, the outbreak of wildfires or the increase of storms or earthquakes and stuff like that. All you do is see that and go, man, the Lord must be coming. Something must be going on. <laughs> I mean, you look at all the confusion and all the foolishness going on every day when you flip on the box. You don't have to watch it for more than 15 minutes and you have to come away from there going, this whole place is stinking crazy. These people are nuts. You're in the grocery line and people are talking to themselves and saying all kind of crazy stuff. You say, what is that? You're getting close to the end. How close? I don't know how close. But suppose it goes on for another 10 years. You're still pretty close. What would you do if you knew you only had 10 years left? You see, you live your life as if you have more than that. We might kick off tonight. I got a friend of mine where I just was. Him and his wife both have COVID. I didn't give it to him, but they got it somehow or another while I was there. And uh, he's got to have major heart surgery uh, on the 30th. The pastor of a church there, he's been there for 25 years. I don't know what's going to happen. As soon as that takes place, he's got 30 days to recover from that. Then they pop him again with another surgery. Won't know how things are going to shake out. You say, what is that? It's tribulation, but it's not the tribulation. You put him on your prayer list. His name's Crutchfield. He's a good man. He's been out there, been going there for over 20 years. His name Dennis Crutchfield. He's out there in Moberly, Missouri. And uh, he's probably sitting at home right now and he's probably grinning. But the, the bottom line is, is he's, he's real sick and he needs to get well because he needs to have a surgery. Because if he don't have, the whole bottom half of his heart doesn't work. But he's a Christian and he's a saved man. He's a pastor of a church. He used to be a missionary in Thailand. Nobody more sold out than that man is. You say, what happened to him? He still got heart trouble. There's no guarantee you won't have that. There's no guarantee against financial problems or against family or friends turning against you. God's fixing to tell you, be aware of that so that when it hits you, don't act all shocked and surprised. It's my gift to you. <laughs> it's a blessing for you now. Romans chapter 8, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Uh, if you suffer with me, you shall also reign with me. So God gives you that suffering and you take that suffering and do it the right kind of way. The Lord rewards you up there when you get there. You had great losses here. Things that have happened you can't explain. You get to the other side of eternity. I can assure you based on God's word, you won't regret any loss you had. But you ain't going to get it till you get there. You can't get your head around it like we talked about it this morning. You can't get your head around it. Look in John chapter number 16. Look in verse number 33. The age of the Lord when he died. Watch this. 16.33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have what? Peace. Peace. In the world you shall have... Alright, now he just gave you something real important there. My peace doesn't come in the world. My peace is in Jesus. My peace isn't found in the world. You know what he just said? Here's the, here's the contrast. In me you have peace. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. In me you have peace. But in the world you shall have what? Well, aren't you having tribulation now? I bet you there's not anybody in here unless you're under two years of age and you probably think when you didn't, Paul didn't give you your candy that you were in tribulation. But beyond all of that kind of stuff, I bet you there's nobody here under the sound of my voice that in just the last 30 days hasn't had all kind of trouble. I bet you you've had some serious tribulation. You know what the Lord said? That's what you get in the world. Why would you expect anything but that? That's the words of Jesus. Miss Pat, you got your Bible in red? Is it in red? That's the words of Jesus. Miss Pat's Bible says so. <laughs> Come over, if you will, please, to the book of Acts, chapter number 14. Now, let's look at what the Apostle Paul says about these things. And when we say that, we say we follow the Apostle Paul. That's Romans to Philemon. Those are glasses that you use to view the entire Bible. You don't kick out parts of the Bible you don't like. You don't go through and, and take a razor blade and say, this is us and this is them. There's a lot of things, for instance, in the book of James that you can use that's practical for you. But you wouldn't want to make it doctrinal, not all the way through. You say, why? You ever read the passage on tongues? And being able to control it, and you can control massive ships with a rudder, but you can't, man can't control it. He says that fires of hell are set on fire by the tongue. He said you can control a 1,800 pound horse with a bridle and a bit, but a man can't control his tongue. Oh, that's some pretty serious stuff, man. 
I mean, there's some stuff in the book of James about having to have faith and that kind of stuff. There's some good practical application, but doctrinally, that's somebody out in the tribulation period. All right, here we are in the book of Acts, chapter number 14, look in verse number 21, talking about the thing in reference to suffering. Let me ask you this, how do you take it when it comes? Jesus Christ gets up from the garden of Gethsemane and the Bible said that he set his face like a flint and for the joy that was set for before him, he endured the cross. He considered a joyous thing. Do you consider tribulation and trouble and trial a joyous thing? I'm not getting on to you. I'm just trying to show you something. God's saying there's something going on that you can't see, that you don't understand. And there's nothing that will shape you faster or quicker or make you any better than trouble, trials, and tribulation. Look in verse 21, 14, 21. And when they had preached the gospel to the city, had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much... Tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Not the tribulation. You don't have to endure to the end in order to be saved. This fellow that went into this dissertation about these horses and so on and so forth, come to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He went into all the stuff about that. He immediately ran to uh, Matthew chapter 24. If you've been listening to any of the preachers lately, they're all in Matthew chapter 24. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to say Matthew 24 is happening right now. Matthew 24 is a passage in the tribulation. It has nothing to do with you. As a matter of fact, when Matthew 24 was penned by the Holy Spirit being the author, the gospel of the grace of God wasn't even known. Jesus hadn't even yet gone to the cross. They don't even take that into consideration. They just blindly go blasting through there and then they read all the things in the passage and tie it into Revelation 6 and Revelation 9 and Revelation chapter 13 and they got the whole thing laid out there and this is how it is and the church is going through the tribulation so you better lay up your guns and lay up your uh, money and you better store this and store that and don't take the mark of the beast and be against the government and be against the world and be against this and be against that. You're not commanded anywhere in the Pauline epistles to do any of that. Your world, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Your treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm talking doctrinal stuff to you right now, ladies and gentlemen. This is important for you. You say, why? So you don't get all spent up about the world. Whether or not you're going to go to a battery-powered car, where do you get your battery-powered cars from? They come from China. Well, China's your enemy. Okay. I don't care if you got a battery-powered Somebody said, you know, you're against people with battery-powered cars. Where did you get that? I don't care if you drive them. I'd get, if, hey, listen, if I could get, I've got to get a golf cart, I'd ride around in a golf cart, beat the fire out of walking. I don't care if you drive a battery-powered car, but who provides the power? Oh, well, see, I just plug it in the wall. Okay, where does that come from? It comes from a plant that's generated by petroleum. If they cut the petroleum off, you ain't going to, you're going to be up the creek with no means of motivation. Did you get that? You say, well, no, not me. What are you going to do? It's like the lady that got really, really mad, you know. She was getting ready to leave her husband, and she slammed the door, and then she came back in, and she said, I'm leaving you as soon as the battery's charged, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that'd be nothing funnier. It'd be like one of the funniest things in the world to see one of those battery-powered cars with blue lights on it, you know. And bzzz, bzzz. I mean, there's nothing like it, man. When you're up to your eyeballs and alligators, and you can hear those four barrels opening up, and those tires squealing, <laughs> It sounds like bicycles coming around the corner, you know, and then they pull up. You don't even know they're there, you know. But I don't care if you drive a, a, a car with a battery in it. It don't make no difference to me. That, all that whole thing is, what are you going to drive in the millennium? You don't have to drive in the millennium. You just think it and you're there. Some of you folks, you don't know what you've been waiting for. You've been hoping and praying for. Maybe when we get around to the millennial kingdom, we'll be back to horses and buggies. Well, what makes you think you won't travel by mental telepathy? Yeah, right. What makes you won't think you won't be like George Jetson? <laughs> what makes you think that you don't have purified, perfect energy and there's no cost? Right. You don't have to pull in the gas station and watch the thing roll off a $100 bill for you to fill up your gas tank. What makes you think it wouldn't be that way? The technology's there. What do you think it's going to be like when the Lord's around? You say, what? If it don't make sense, there's a buck in it. Sure as I'm standing here, that makes a buck in it. There's a lot of cheaper ways to do it. What do you do with a guy that uh, years ago, he found out how to make a car run on water. 
What happened to him? He's dead. You say, what happened to him? Well, you have to read all the conspiratorial things, but somebody, you know, got rid of him quick because why? Well, we can't have that around here running off of water. I mean, we need petroleum. Everything you've got, you're sitting on petroleum. You're walking on petroleum. You say, no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. The, the fibers in that stuff's made, put together. The wood and the glue and all the stuff that holds those benches together. The carpet that you're walking on, that's all made out of petroleum products. Go green. <laughs> Be Kermit. Peace, bro. We good. <laughs> you're smoking crack, man. I mean, I'm all for it, man. Go for it. I don't, I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me. But to make that part of the tribulation and put you in Matthew 24 over now all of a sudden Tesla's inventions are coming to the forefront. We know we're in the tribulation. <laughs> what? I can't imagine somebody in a congregation go, could you point that out in the passage, please? Where is that at? You know, well, you have to turn it up and you have to work it like a Rubik's Cube. And then you can see the word Tesla spelled out there in the original Hebrew. And then we'll know that, you know, that's the lightning that hit Rabin over there. Okay. All right. Let me know when you come down off that high. First Corinthians chapter number four. Look, if you will, please. First Corinthians four, come to verse number nine. Talking about trouble, trials, and tribulation. Don't get caught up in these fools. Amen. Listen, I know they got enough letters behind their name to make alphabet soup. I understand that. You wouldn't want to play a game of Scrabble with them. They got more letters on their bar than you do. I understand that. That doesn't mean they know anything about the Bible. Amen. As a matter of fact, generally speaking, the more intellectual they get, the stupider they get when it comes to the Bible. They try to make sense of the whole thing. Y'all got more sense than that. You know when somebody's doing that. Well, they're trying to figure out what we're going to do. Listen, you know what you need to look for? You need to look for death or rapture. And all the other stuff, you're just, you're just on the sideshow. You're just watching one day at a time. All right, verse number nine. For I thank God, <clears throat> I think that God hath set forth us apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and angels unto men. Ain't that something for him to treat his apostles that way? That's the big boys. That's, that's the big kahunas. The apostles. The ones that are going to sit on thrones at one of the 12 gates uh, up there in New Jerusalem. Those guys. He said they're an all scour. They're a spectacle unto who? The world. We are fools for Christ's sake. <laughs> now he's going to get sarcastic. But you're wise. We are weak but you're strong. You're honorable, but we're despised. Even unto the present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless and persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made to fill through the world and an all scouring to all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I what? I warn you. You know what the Apostle Paul just said to you? He said, listen, man, we are the off-scouring of the world. And he said, now I'm, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to warn you that if I'm going to follow the Lord, that's what you can expect. Well, when you get ready to lead Max to the Lord, that's not the verse you want to go to and say, by the way, after you get saved, people are going to laugh at you and they're going to make fun of you and you're going to be an all-scouring to them and you're not going to be politically popular and you're not going to be one of the people that everybody wants to run to in time of difficulty or trouble. Max would be like, well, I think I don't want to get saved just yet. The verses you go to is show him the verses on hell and show him he's going to burn like a torch or like a grease ball down there for all eternity. Come out the great white throne, match his righteousness to God's righteousness and then wind up in the lake of fire and all matter of, 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 of demise when he comes down there to the lake of fire. You don't want to deal with him and tell him, hey, being a Christian, boy, ain't it great? Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is, is the Lord said, guess what? As a Christian, you're going to get hammered. Enjoy it while you can enjoy it. But sooner or later, trouble is coming to your doorstep. But man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. No one is immune to it. Everybody gets it. Jesus got it. All the apostles got it. I can't imagine being like Pilate. I know about Pilate. I know enough about him to know this. I know what tradition says about him. Tradition says that every time he had an opportunity to do something with the Lord, as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 3 and in Acts chapter number 4, you find out that Pilate believed that Jesus was innocent. 
And he tried his best to work his way out of that thing on about four or five different occasions. And then finally he could not get him off his hands and he just couldn't do it. And finally he said, I got it figured out now. I'll give him Barabbas. Barabbas and I mean, uh, Barabbas or Jesus. They'll certainly take Jesus. They took Barabbas. They had him cornered, man. I mean, checkmated. And so he winds up turning over Jesus. He washes his hands. And tradition, I don't know if it's true or not. Tradition says he went out to one of the far islands out there in the Roman Empire and killed himself. Boy, don't you know he regrets that decision? As soon as he killed himself, you know what he did? He wound up down there swimming around in hell and washing his hands in hell and saying, boy, I sure wish I hadn't have done that. I sure wish I hadn't have done that. I sure wish I hadn't have done that. Well, that's a different kind of trouble. That's not the kind of trouble you're going to have. But a guilty conscience will drive you up the wall, won't it? I mean, won't it, won't it keep you up at night? I mean, if you've got any kind of constitution and conscience about you at all, don't it keep you up at night? Doesn't it make you feel funny when somebody's looking at you and you think they're looking through you? Look, if you will, please come to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Preacher, why are you telling me this? You're scaring me. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth. You suffer for oppression or for persecution, for affliction, for agony, for hurt, for misery, for pain. First uh, Peter 4 says, uh, uh, let's see, First Peter 4, First Peter 4. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as so some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in that you are partakers of Christ's sufferings for you. And then he goes down in that passage there on the right page there, left hand. He comes down that passage and he, he says something along the lines of, uh, but don't suffer as a murderer or a busybody in other men's matters and something, something, something else there. And then he comes, but if you suffer for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit and glory of God rest on you. Now I misquoted some of that. I can't, it won't come to the surface right now. That's in 1 Peter chapter 4. But you know what he said about the trial? He said it was a fiery trial. You've been through some, haven't you? They left some marks on you, didn't they? I saw a guy one time, man, I mean, I, I, he was in a bad situation over in uh, the uh, sandbox over there in uh, Iraq when he went over there. And uh, he got in a real big mashup over there, and then he got into one of those uh, IEDs that hit him, those uh, bombs on the side of the road. They ran over it. He got trapped in the Humvee there, and I mean, it burned him like he was in a skillet, man. And they brought him back over here, and they got him back to life, had all of his hair burned off of him, and his face looked like it had been melted, strings of flesh running across his eye. You could see his eye moving behind those bits of flesh and stuff like that, and his hands burned and things like that, where the ten sinews and the tendons and all had twisted up his hands from drawing up in that fire and stuff like that and he's sitting there and I'm looking and I'm thinking boy he's got a bunch of scars on him but some of you got some scars on you people just can't see them there are scars just like that because you what fiery trial you've been through it some of you hadn't you I mean it's been hard hadn't it it's less some scar tissue hadn't it and that scar tissue tender I mean, you've gotten a little bit accustomed to it, but you move a certain way and it sort of catches on something and kind of hurts a little bit. Somebody says something just the right way at the right time and boy, it's like PTSD on steroids, man. You ever deal with little children before? I dealt with them before in my past. Little children have horrible, unspeakable, ungodly things, uh, demonic, devilish things that have happened to them when they're little. And they grow up and later on they have memories of those things occurring. And you sit down and you get ready to talk to them. Boy, it's like they travel back in time in a split second like that. And I mean, they're shaking like a leaf in the wind in the wintertime about to turn loose of a tree. Scared, slapped to death. You say, why? Well, scarred. They used to say about us up there, they said, hey, the homicide boys would say to us, that, man, we'd rather do what we do instead of what you do. At least our victims are dead. Yours are walking dead. If you've been through that kind of pain and that kind of suffering, you got scars and they're real and you've been hurt and you've been hurt bad. And it's a fiery trial, isn't it? It's a difficult thing. You say, well, I got saved. Yeah, but the scars are still there. They'll be there until the day you die. You'll learn to live with them. But I'm careful about that stuff. When you come to around that kind of deal, get around that, you know what you better be careful about? You better be careful about being opening that can of worms too wide. You don't know what you might come up with. You don't know why some people are the way that they are. You want to be careful. That's 
tender ground. I've seen elderly women, and I mean no disrespect when I say that. When I say elderly women, I mean women that are past their mid-60s. They're way up in life. They look way back before the stuff was ever made public. They look way back when there was an uncle or a step the parent or something like that. Things that happened to them 60 years, 70 years ago, and they look back on that stuff just like it happened yesterday. They've been living with that all their life. So what is that? It's a fiery trial. You lose a loved one, stays with you, doesn't it? I don't know how many years. I, I'm, I still got it. It's in my library at the, uh, at the house. I still got an old golf glove of my daddy. It smells like my daddy. You say, oh, God, here we go again with that. Okay, well, just let me tell it, you know. Every now and then I go over there, I pick it up. You know, I just put it on. I just kind of look at it. I, I smell it just like that, just like that. Uh, I'm standing on the Dunes golf course with him, and we're listening to him talking to different individuals. I mean, like that, it's like being transported. Uh, still a little bit of scar tissue there. And take it off and put it up there and wipe the tears off my eyes and then move, go on. But there's fiery trials. You say, what? The Lord promised you that. He didn't lie to you. He's not a scam artist. He didn't tell you get saved, your problems are over. He didn't say you're going to be removed from death or divorce or disease. He never said that. He never said debt's not coming in your direction. He never said that. He said, hey, in this world, you know what you're going to have? Christian, you're going to have tribulation. So the one thing that everybody has in common, he rewards us for it. I don't know if you've ever had to go through the, 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 the horribleness of, uh, of not having a good marriage and then having to go through a divorce and what that must be like and to live with that from now on or to live with a prodigal child or a prodigal grandchild. So it will never happen to me. Okay, be careful. Be careful. I mean, I'm talking about, they may, they may wait till they're 40 or 50 to go prodigal. They can go prodigal. Amen. You say, what do you do? Stay humble. It can tear you up, can't it? Amen. Can it get your attention pretty quick? Yes. Let's see what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Can we pick it up in verse number 3? 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Blessed be God, even the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Well, thank the Lord, Paul. What are you setting me up for here? Paul said, well, you're going to need some comfort. Why is that? Because who comforted us in all of our what? Tribulation. No Matthew 24 in the passage. He's talking about trouble. How do you know? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Tribulation is trouble. Right there in the passage. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound, so also our consolation aboundeth by Christ. Whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, the effectual and enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be the, in the, in the uh, consolation. I would not have you, brethren, to be ignorant of our trouble that came to us in Asia. We're pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch as we despaired even, despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death on ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises from the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust, and you should trust, yet he shall deliver you. You know what Paul just said to you in that particular passage right there? He said, hey man, you're going through something right now, but it's not because of something you did wrong. It's because you're doing right and God's going to use you to help somebody else when they go through it. God takes your trouble that you go through and enables you to be able to minister to somebody that somebody can't do what I call clinically. You can't learn that stuff out of a book. Some of you individuals have gone through trouble and trials and difficulties and can minister to people more than I can take the Bible and read it from Genesis to Revelation and help them because you've experienced it. You know what it's like. You know how it feels. I like that song that the kids sing, or I think it was Sound Doctrine used to sing, Do You Know How It Feels, you know, and so on and so forth. Do you know how it feels? Well, I wonder sometimes, do you know how it feels to hurt? Do you know how it is to have pain? I used to think I knew some things about pain and different things like that, and I used to kind of look at people who said they had back pain, and then one day I got back pain, and then I realized this ain't no joke, man. <laughs> I mean, this is some serious stuff. 
I'm making it out just because it looks okay on the inside, but you get a good case of sciatica or something along those lines, and you get that nerve pinched, and it runs down from the back end of your back right down through your hind end cheek and right down the back side of your leg. And, buddy, you talk about setting you on fire. I mean, wake you up where you can't sleep, you can't stand, you can't sit, and it's nerve pain. You can't take enough dope to knock you out. They have to cut your leg off to knock it out. You say, what is that? Well, then you're a little more careful when somebody says, boy, I really got pain. I've been there before. You ever had that kind of tooth pain that a pain pill don't, don't knock it out? That kind that, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, it wakes you up for no reason. You haven't done anything. You haven't even eaten anything. And all of a sudden, the nerve just decides it's going to wake you up. You ain't going back to sleep after that. You can eat a bottle of Tylenol, and you'll die before that pain goes away. You say, why? It's nerve pain. But you know what I do know? I do know I'd rather go to a dentist that knows what it's like to have nerve pain than one that's never experienced it. I got a good dentist. I'll say that about him. I got a good dentist. Before he gets ready to drill on my teeth, he said, I want to make sure the nerve's good and dead. And he always checks first. And he takes that little thing with the hook on the end of it, you know, that looks like Captain Hook's hook, like a gaff that you're going to get a fish with. It's about that big and got a big hook on the end of it. <laughs> That's what it looks like when you're in there under laughing gas, man. I mean, that thing's like, man, he's going to take my head off with that thing. And he reaches in there and he touches that nerve. And if he sees you wince, he say, hold on. <laughs> and he loads you up again. Feels like your jaw's about this big when you get out of there. I don't care. I can't feel no pain. <laughs> now, you can't eat anything after that because everything you put in your mouth, it just falls out. <laughs> And it's kind of like some of y'all in a conversation. Everything in your head just comes out of your mouth. But, but that's a whole other conversation there. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. You know what Paul just said to you? He said, hey, listen, man, who wants to read this in the Bible? I mean, you're always looking for comfort. You're always looking for, you know, for, for a, 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 a Lord, preacher, tell me well, how we're going to be rich. How we're going to have a, a, a happy marriage. Well, when you marry Jesus, you got a perfect husband. Until then, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> so we do everything right. Like I said, good luck. It's a roll of the dice. There ain't no guarantees. There ain't nobody that has ever on the face of this earth, including Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, that ever had a perfect marriage. It's called marriage. You say, what is that? It's another word for sweat. Amen. If you ain't working up a sweat, you're sweating because you're in the box. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Come on, can I get a witness? Amen. Somebody beside Brother Holland, Jennifer just smacked him across the, <laughs> you know, like, what do you mean? You made me look bad. No, <laughs> that's honest. He ain't perfect all the time. I'm sure she could say amen. She's just, I'm a woman. I'm not supposed to speak in church. Sure, there's times you can say amen. That's not preaching, but it makes good preaching. <laughs> Ladies, I feel for you. You, you married to some ogres, man. <laughs> Second Corinthians, you, ladies, you could have said amen right there. You, I set you up. You didn't hit it. Look at verse number 4. 2 Corinthians 7, look at verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our... Wow. And when we were come to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Does that sound familiar? But we were troubled on every side with outward fightings and with interferes. Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforteth us in coming of Titus. Well, thank you. Consolation in verse number 7. And then he talks about a letter that he writes there. You know what he just said to you? He said, hey man, we have not rested. We are tired. We are exhausted. We are worn out. We are having tribulation. You say, what is that? It's called the Christian life. It's you sitting your time and spinning around on the wheel. And the potter's making you what he wants you to be. I like that song, the little kids. I don't know if they sing it anymore in the little tiny classes. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. We're just in Corinthians. Isn't it interesting? He spends a lot of time in Corinthians about this because Corinthians is a carnal church. And he spends a lot of time in that for a reason. Because uh, carnal people don't like this kind of preaching. I like that song the little ones sing. I don't know where the little ones, they're probably in the nursery and all that. About Lindley's age or all that. They sing that, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him something to make the moon and the stars. Something, 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 Jupiter and Mars. But he's still working on me. <laughs> in other words, he made the whole solar system and he's still messing with me and you. He's been working on me 60 years. Wouldn't you think he could do something in 60 years? 
I mean, really, what you, I mean, think about it. Lord, are you done with him yet? No, he ain't done. Put him back in there again. It's like trying to make a cake. I made a cake maybe five times in my life. And the biggest problem I have with cake and biscuits is, is I keep pulling them out to look to see if they're ready and then put them back in. And then the oven loses temperature and she's like, babe, you got to leave the thing alone. Turn the light on and watch it. I turn on the light and I just sit there like this. And she goes, what are you looking at? I'm watching the cake bake. Well, you can't tell if it's baking unless it's burning. So then she goes out of the room and then I... You know, and then, and she's like, did you open the oven? Uh, that's why only about five times in my life you say, why? They come out like pudding. <laughs> I can't wait to eat them. I'm just soon go ahead. Why don't you just, she said, just mix the stuff up and just eat it out of the bowl, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But you know what the Lord has to do? He has to keep putting us in the oven. He has to keep working on us. I like to be where the Apostle Paul is. That's a statement and a half when the Apostle Paul says this. You know what he said? I am now ready to be offered. God's done working on me. And what he hadn't finished, he's going to finish up in heaven. Wouldn't you like to have that testimony? You know what you got? You got Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. You got the Apostle Paul showing you how a Christian ought to do things. Look in verse number 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I have a note in my Bible, do you really want this kind of power? Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Did you read that verse right there? Do you take pleasure in those things? I preached a little bit on this forgiveness this morning. Can you take the wrong? Paul said, I took the wrong. Jesus said, I took the wrong. Can you take the wrong? Paul said, I take pleasure in it. Being falsely accused. Being reproached. Infirmities. Physical ailments. Necessities. Things that take place. Persecution. Distresses for Christ's sake. He says, hey, you know what? I take pleasure in that. You say, why? Because I'm trying to win the Lord. Here's what I wrote down. I think I got this from the old preacher. I have it in uh, notes to myself that I have here. What's one of the reasons for suffering? To make me humble. Yeah. And boy, nothing will take that strut out of your step and knock the pride out of you faster than suffering. Okay. To make me fruitful. Nothing like a pruning hook to kind of hurt you a little bit when he knocks off what you think is good fruit and he cuts it off and doesn't let it bear any fruit until it re-sprouts again. Makes me able to minister to other people. Number three, allows me to sympathize with other people. Sympathize and empathize. I'd been around a lot of death, maybe more than most, just because of what I used to do. I don't say that in a braggadocious way, but where I rode and things like that, I was around a lot of it. I saw a lot of it, a lot of different things I saw. But it, it, it had a kind of a clinical deal for me. I was able to compartmentalize it. I rode around a bunch of guys that taught me how to be able to do what I needed to do and function without getting all caught up and spun up in all the emotion that's going on in some of the most horrible things. I, I mean, the, 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 the lady in the phone booth still I can't get that off of mind where the guy had her trapped in the phone booth and just cut her to pieces with a machete. I mean, cut her to pieces like you would saw up chicken. And she's on the phone with a 911 girl and screaming and holler and you can hear him just hacking and cutting and hitting the bones and stuff like that. I remember all those kind of things. It didn't have the effect on me. Maybe it shouldn't be. It's like, okay, we're going to go to, you know, Cotton's Barbecue and eat barbecue. I didn't, I, I, please don't think of me being cold or callous. Just I had a job to do and we caught the bad guy and he went to prison for the rest of his life and so it should have got the death penalty, but bleeding hearts, you know, understood that he was probably warped when he was a child and misunderstood and that's why he hacked her to death that way and killed her mother in the house before he killed her. But at any rate, uh, we, we get through a lot kind of stuff and then my dad died and when my dad died if you listen to my preaching you will hear a definite change within six weeks of that event of watching him go through all that suffering right at the very end of his life and at 64 years of, a, of age going absent from the body and present with the Lord and all of a sudden I experienced something that wasn't clinical I lost somebody I really, really loved. And all of a sudden, death took on an entirely different appeal to me and a different approach. And you know what it did? It made me able to help other people. Oh, I know how that feels. 
I could go over to the medical examiner's office and they would do all the stuff and they'd let me watch and I'd watch what they did and sometimes in an investigation, sometimes out of curiosity. Uh, one time they recovered a, a 410 wadding out of the back of a guy's throat and stuff and I'm waiting with the bag to get all this stuff. And anyhow, I'm, I'm sitting there, look at the stuff, but then all of a sudden, there's your daddy. You say, what was it? God's way of shaping me and saying, hey, death's a part of life, but you got to realize these people that have lost these people in these terrible tragedies, they hurt. Yes, amen. And you know what? If you listen to it, you know what you'll hear? You'll hear a change. You'll hear a change in my preaching after Jim died. You'll hear a change in my preaching after the old preacher. You say, why? It has a profound effect on you. Amen. God lets you go through things, but it's not just clinical. Otherwise, you know what happens? You can't comfort other people. Some of you folks have an opportunity. God can really use you more than he can use a preacher. You know what a preacher has to be? He has to be smart enough to keep his mouth shut when he's standing at a funeral and he feels like he has to say something, but he can't, like the curl in a pig's tail, he can't add anything to it at all. The family is grieving and hurting and they're looking to the preacher and the preacher's like, you know, well, Romans 8, 28, uh, you know, I mean, well, God's got a good reason for all this. And I, you know what the best thing to do is? Is I'm praying for you. Yes. Amen. I'm praying for you. A preacher has to know when to hold them, when to fold them, man. Just can't explain it. I'm just sorry. We've had some deaths that have taken place here. You can't explain them with an explaining the machine. So what do you do? I love you. I'm praying for you. But once you've done it and experienced it in a way that's not clinical anymore, it changes your approach to other people. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I hope I'm helping you. Amen. One of the other reasons for suffering, I've helped two people anyway. That's a blessing. So it's better than none. I mean, that's not a bad deal. Uh, to prove God's sufficiency. And I don't have to have anybody but Him to get me through. Amen. Amen. And I like this one. To make heaven more real to me. You know, since I've lost some friends and all that, the old preacher, you know how he used to say, you know, I'm getting where I'm getting more stacked up on the other side, you know, than I am over here, you know, kind of makes you have a hankering to be able to go home. You know, all these guys I came up with, they're not around anymore. Well, I'm starting to see them go. I'm starting to watch them cross the great divide. I'm starting to watch them pass across. I'm getting old enough now where I'm seeing some of them checking out early. You know what it makes you want to do? It makes, you, it makes heaven real. Boy, when they get ready to pass from this life to the next, can you imagine if there's no heaven? How would you comfort somebody like that? You've got to be with them when they go. <laughs> What's the point of your prayer if when you're praying, you're not praying to a real God and they're going to a real place? Well, I'm telling you, sure as I'm standing here, I'm telling you the Lord comes in and does some kind of supernatural transaction that takes place there for a saved loved one. And I believe when that loved one passes, I don't care how much that physical body struggles, I think the Lord steps in there and says to them, hey, are you ready to go to the house? And I think they look and say, man, Lord, this is unbelievable. I've never felt like this in my life. I feel so wonderful right now. I'm at such peace. Boy, I really, who's that down there? Uh, it's you. You're struggling. You, oh, Lord, I'd rather be with you. I've never been loved like this in my life. Everything's, all the tumblers fell into place, Lord. All the locks opened up. Everything's done. I haven't felt this clean. I haven't felt, man, where are we going? Oh, we're just going to go a little place like paradise for a little while and and you're going to spend some time with me. You ready to go? And absent from the body, I'm present with the Lord. You say, well, how do they pass Alfred to Connors and all that kind of thing? What makes you think they don't just step through a split and just step right there? You don't know. I know how we preach it, but we're not talking about you going to the New Jerusalem. Paul said, I know absent from the body, present with the Lord. He's not bound by time. Don't you know that? Well, as soon as you shake this lead weight, you're not, you're not bound by time. You can be wherever he is. That where I am, there you may be. See, there's John 14. Y'all know the Bible. Can I give you just a couple of more? Trying to make sense of your suffering. You say, what is that? What about all the, the, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, and all that other kind of stuff? You needn't worry about all that. 
You needn't worry about him writing something up in the sky for you, looking for blood moons and shemitahs. You needn't worry about whether or not they're going to, they've got all the temple's artifacts together. They're fixing to build the temple. Uh, they're going to do this. They're going to do that. None of that stuff matters to you. You ain't looking for a temple. You're looking for Jesus. Well, what about when the Antichrist comes? You know, it's going to be uh, George Bush reincarnated, or it's going to be uh, Reagan, or it's going to be uh, Mark on your head, uh, uh, Gorbachev, or it's going to be... Um, uh, the, the peacemaker over there, um, I'll think of his name in just a minute, Kissinger and all those other kind of things and stuff like that. Uh, those all may be types, but they're not him. You say, who's the Antichrist? I don't know and I don't care. You say, well, I ain't looking for him. Looking for the Antichrist doesn't make me live a cleaner life. The Lord tells me in Titus 2, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath this hope in him, do you know the rest of the verse? What's that, Brother Dan? Purifieth himself. Thinking about Jesus coming, not the devil coming. I could care less if the devil comes. You say, why? Because when the devil comes, I'm gone. Pass him on the way up. The Lord said, get. And down he goes. You say, well, don't you think he's here now? I don't know. I hope he is. I hope he's getting ready to restructure everything. I hope the ten toes are beginning to wake up and they've been asleep for a long time, you know, like you go to sleep at night and you get your legs all cattywampus, you get ready to get up the next morning and it's like, huh, I can't feel my legs, I can't feel my legs. <laughs> Don't worry, they're just asleep. They'll wake up in a minute, you know, that kind of thing. But it's a little freaky for a second there. You ever sleep in your arm and it's like... <laughs> and you're looking at it and you're going, you need to scratch your nose right now and that arm's going... I'm sleeping. And the Lord said, that's how I feel like when I'm trying to wake you up to get you to go to church, you know, you sleeping. How's that feeling? And then you're thinking for a minute because you're not feeling any tingling, you're thinking, what if it stays? Right? And then all of a sudden it kind of starts coming around and then when the nerves start to wake up, the first feeling you get is, is it, it tickles. Like it's kind of like, it almost makes you laugh and it's like, it ain't funny, it ain't moving. Right? And then all of a sudden it begins to work. Well, you know what happens? That Bible teaches you that going to heaven is like you going to sleep and waking up in a place where Jesus lives. That Bible says if you have the hope of looking for Jesus Christ, you're not worried about everything else. It's going to come to an end sooner or later. And let me ask you something. What are you going to do about it? Did you know Iran has nuclear weapons? You say, no, we prevented them from having them. They've had them for years. Surely you don't pay attention to the rhetoric in the news media. I'll bet you half of the people, in, no, I bet you three quarters of you don't know the history on the Ukraine. I bet you three quarters of you do not know the history of the Ukraine. I'll bet you that. I bet you Alex back there can tell you the history of the Ukraine. He's from there. And her uncle Perry Demopoulos is over there. I bet you they can tell you. I bet you don't know anything about it. You know where the majority of drug money ran through, where people ran through the cartels and all ran their money through? They ran it through Ukraine. You know where all of your cartels in the United States of America, people that have a lot of money, I mean big money, I'm talking billions. I'm not talking about chump change, million dollars or whatever. I'm talking billions of dollars. You know who's been running it through their banks? Ukraine. You didn't know that, did you? Russia bear goes over there and he's gobbling them up right and left and so on and so forth. You know who turned against God a long time ago? You haven't paid any attention to Mr. Zelensky, have you? You're just behind him because of what happened, what looks like human suffering. You haven't paid any attention to the corruption in that country, have you? I'm telling you too much stuff. Some of you are thinking I'm all for the war. I'm not for any kind of war. I'm just trying to tell you, you're, you're, when it comes to that, you're ignorant. And God's judgment falls. You don't, it ain't what you see in the newspapers. There's a lot more going on that God's just not letting pass. Do you know where the Nazis went after World War II? Do you have any idea? Do you know where they went to? They went to the Ukraine. Do you know why Russians hated the Germans so bad? Because of that. They were allowed to take solace in Ukraine. And they wouldn't let them come and stay with them. So they went to Ukraine. Am I telling the truth? Yes, sir. You see, you never thought. Well, 
might be something going on that you don't know, that you don't read in the everyday newspaper. Amen. See, preacher, I never heard of that. That's just, I mean, CNN has never said that. And do you think they will? Why do you think they're so spun up and worried about where their money's going to be and where the money's going to go and how things are going to go? Watch the birdie, watch the birdie, watch the birdie. That's why they're worried about it. That's why they're sending billions of dollars over there to defend. You say, what? Man, if they close that cash cow, you're headed for trouble, boy. That's where all their retirement accounts are. Do you know who owns a multi-billion dollar house in the state of Florida besides Trump? Do you have any idea? The guy that's running the country over there in Ukraine, Zelensky. Oops. What's he got a vacation house over here for? Close your mouth. You're drooling on yourself. <laughs> the Lord's got it figured, boy. I mean, backward for the very idea that a preacher could tell you that's the horses of the apocalypse. You got no business being over there in that foolishness. You got no business being over there in a fight over there. They're not fighting for democracy. The military is being used to protect somebody's investment. Amen. But I know you think, I know you think everybody's just been doing everything up right. That's why millions and millions of dollars and stuff that's been done with China and stuff like that has been stashed over there. And that's why they've enjoyed special treatment for years and years and years and years until a guy dying of cancer over there by the name of Putin who rides around on a horse with his shirt off and that kind of a deal. And now he's got cancer. He said, I'm sick of it and I'm going to get him. That's an old KGB agent. Did you know that? He knows the truth. How come all of a sudden there's all this stuff about Nazis coming out? That's an old man that's still got an axe to grind. I didn't say it was right. That's terrible when we went over there to Moldova and you got to go through all that stuff. Not only do they have bad bathroom facilities and things like that, man. I mean, when they get you, they get your passport, they got you there. I mean, boy, you learn real quick to appreciate the freedom you have to move here. You can't go from here to across the street without somebody jacking you up. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. And you all of a sudden thinking, man, I hope I get back. I hope I get back. Can I give you one more? Let me give you this. I'm sorry I'm running overboard. I'm getting, my ears are turning red now. Ladies and gentlemen, don't you ever think for one second that God doesn't have a rhyme and a reason for everything that's going on and it ain't in politics. Amen. You are chump change when it comes to God's <laughs> worldwide plan. Do you know what the Lord says about nations? About nations. You know what He says about them? All the nations in the world, all the nations, they're a drop in the bucket. No, they're less than nothing. And you're worried about a nation? One nation under God? Indivisible, is it? With liberty, is it? And justice for all, is it? Well, you just told a lie. <laughs> it isn't any of those things. I mean, that's a good, I pledge allegiance, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm all for it. But let's be real. That ain't real. The only thing you got real is sitting right there in your lap. Amen. You say, what are you trying to do to me? I'm trying to get you to focus on the right. spiritual, Amen. not on the here and now. You are literally a hair's breadth away from a cataclysmic event taking place and the United States of America being reduced to a third world country and life as you know it changing just like that. You say, oh, well, it never happen. You forget two years ago already? Right. Two years ago, you would walk out on the street without a mask on and you couldn't get permission to go anywhere. You couldn't buy eggs and bread and milk and you couldn't do this and couldn't do that and everybody's scared of that and you're locked in. No storm coming. No hurricane coming. No atomic threat coming. No military moving down the street. No tanks coming. No bazookas flying. No airplanes flying over your head. Nobody riding a horse. A microscopic bug and you're in your houses shaking like a dog poop, uh, 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 getting rid of a pizza see. That's all it took. Everybody's, it's going to be martial law. We're going to be invaded. Kim jong Un's going to fire a nuclear weapon. China is going to get together with Russia and they're going to invade us from California. And we got submarines off the coast. And the Lord goes, it's going to be a microscopic bug and you're going to be cowering in your houses. 
shut down the country and didn't fire a shot. He just offered shots. <laughs> God's got it figured. You know what he's doing? He's saying, Christian, get ready. You say, why? Because you're going to have a great sign. Now, watch. Here's your signs, wonders, and miracles. Are you ready? Look in verse 12. Truly the signs of a what? Are wrought among you in all patience, and signs, and wonders, and what? You know what he just gave you in context? The signs of an apostle's suffering. It's trouble. <laughs> it's trials. It's if I'm living for the Lord, there's marks in my body. I got a history of trouble and God getting me through and storms and God getting me through and jail and God getting me through and prison and God getting me through and stripes upon my back, 40 stripes save one five times uh, and God getting me through and in nakedness and in peril and God getting me through and in trouble to my own countrymen and God getting me through and in perils here and in perils there and a day and a night in the deep and in shipwreck and God getting me through and God getting me through and God getting me through and then he follows 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 with 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and he said boy I'm going to tell you what the power of his resurrection is nothing to be sneezed at, but it comes with the fellowship of his sufferings. The signs of an apostle. Pete comes out after he gets done. The Lord gets him back over in, in fellowship. We're done now. He gets him back in fellowship. And uh, the first thing that happens is, is he comes over there in Acts chapter uh, 3. And in Acts chapter number 3, the boy's out there outside the temple and alms for the poor, alms for the poor, arms for the disabled, alms, could you give me alms? I'm poor, I'm broke, I hate to beg, but I got to beg. Sir, do you have anything for me? Pete says, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. And he reaches down there like the Lord reached down out of the ocean there and pulled him out of that thing. And he grabs a hold of his hand and supernaturally that boy's legs come up underneath him and he pulls him up and says, arise and walk. And the boy runs and jumps and hops and skips. He doesn't go two chapters. And they got him stretched out far and wide up on a whipping post. A spectacle in front of everybody. And they beat the tar out of him. Do you know why? Because he dared mention the name of Jesus. It wasn't for the miracle he performed by raising the paraplegic man. It was because they said, you can do whatever you want to do, but you can't say Jesus. And Pete said, can't say what? Jesus? Did you say Jesus? Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. <laughs> Peter, we're telling you now, you need to stop that. You can't say that. Can't say what? That, what you just said. Wh what did I say? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting senile. I've been through a lot of things. You know, I'm just an old fisherman. Oh, say what? You can't say that name. What name? That name that you say is above every name. The sweetest name I know. Uh, what, what name would that be? You know, Peter, the name you keep saying, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And you know what they do? They beat him for saying Jesus. And you know what Peter does? He comes to the end of that thing in chapter 5 there. And he's sitting there with his buddy and he said, Boy, ain't this a blessing. <laughs> ain't this wonderful. Boy, that we have an opportunity to suffer for doing the right thing for Jesus' sake. Ain't this good, man? Boy, the ministry, what a blessing. I got some stripes on me. Paul ain't got nothing on me, man. <laughs> Who's Paul? I'll have to tell you about that later. He hasn't been called out yet, but he's coming because the Jews are going to reject and all that. Where'd you get all that, Peter? Uh, well, the Lord shared some things with me when we were walking on the water. Did I ever tell you about that time on the water? <laughs> uh, listen, listen, folks. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you, don't panic. I'm trying to tell you, I wish I could guarantee you, I wish I could promise you, you're not going to have trouble. I can't promise you that. I can promise you the king of trouble will be with you in any trouble. I can promise you he has a reason behind whatever it is. And when you get to the other side, I honestly believe what I'm about to tell you and I'm done. I honestly believe when you get to the other side and you see what he did with the trouble in your life, you know what I believe you'll say to him? Well, Lord, I don't know why he didn't give me more. Lord, I'm sorry I complained so much. I never realized, well, golden that gift was. I never understood it, Lord. I, My goodness, Lord, I... Could I go back down there now that I understand it? No, no, I needed you to do it and just accept it by faith. We're not even halfway there. I'll give you some more if you'll come Wednesday night.
No, I don't think I'll be here Wednesday night. But if you'll come Sunday, I'll be here Sunday. <laughs> I'll give you some more. I'll give it to you in Sunday school and I'll give it to you Sunday night. You, you say, why? It's the Christian life. But it's good when you know what it is. And then that way when the wind ain't blowing, the hummingbirds are flying. They don't fly much in the wind. The hummingbirds come out, beating them wings about a million miles an hour. They sound like bees. The lilies are coming up. Slight breeze blowing out of the north. Just a little bit cool. Fall coming on early. Leaves beginning to turn off a little bit. Nice and cool. No trouble. You get up. Get a good cup of coffee. and Sit around read your Bible. And all of a sudden you say, boy. Well, praise the Lord. No trouble today. I hadn't got out of bed yet. But <laughs> so far. Sure has been a good day. Father, bless your word. Help us to understand these matters. I pray, Lord, that you'll give me a better dialect and a better brain power, a better ability to be able to convey such deep truths that your folks will be able to get them to be well prepared for what it is that is certain to befall every one of us. And questions that have been asked for decades and decades and centuries and centuries, and yet your Bible makes it so clear and so plain. I pray, God, that you'll give me the speech to be able to communicate to the people that they might grasp these truths as important as they are to them as their salvation is. We pray, Lord, that you'll go with them as they go through their separate ways this week. Be with them and comfort them as only you can. We'd ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.